For almost a century, pollsters have been interpreting public opinion. Would you like to participate in a poll about the upcoming election? Their method is straightforward. Ask a small group of people questions and then use that sample group as a representation of the opinions of the entire population. Thank you, sir. It's been nice meeting you. Well, you're welcome. Good night. Thank you for coming by. But in recent decades, the public has soured on answering questions, calls, or doorbells. And instead of being available at a single point of contact, people have become increasingly mobile, which makes traditional polling more challenging. Today, people are expressing their opinions and habits through mobile and internet technologies, including smartphones and social media. That avalanche of information is making possible new methods to explore what the public is thinking. Today, data is available everywhere. Credit card information, loyalty card information, demographic information, and community organization information. Think about the things you sign up for. Think about the events you go to. And when you click that little box that says, I have read and agreed to the terms of service, that is contractual. Several screens of stuff that you didn't read, Nobody ever reads it. It wouldn't really matter if you read it anyway. So that means we've got information from all over the place. And that's actually what makes it quite valuable. Many people give Google their email data via Gmail, their video data via YouTube, their physical location via Google Maps. So when you connect all that data together, it's remarkable the intimate picture it paints of the individual which I actually think eclipses our own memory, and that we forget all the places we go to. The challenge is knowing how to extract meaningful information from what looks like random noise. That's where applied artificial intelligence, known as AI, presents both promise and risk. While dystopian science fiction dreams up worlds where machines rule over humans, AI is more commonly understood by its engineers as the ability of a machine to learn and think. They consider it a human-guided tool that learns by digesting massive volumes of data, like social media, and then identifying patterns in the noise. What if there was an AI that could use those patterns to predict how humans would behave in the future, like predicting the outcome of an election? The campaign for the next Canadian federal election has just kicked off. While Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party copes with a justice scandal and the ouster of two ministers, the Conservatives, New Democrats, and Bloc Québécois all have new and untested leaders. Despite a tight six-week campaign, the parties are slow to outline their platforms. It's unclear if voters will make their choices based on the issues, the party, or the leader. In Canada's capital, Ottawa, a small startup is using AI to predict the upcoming election. People are calling this the Seinfeld election. Really? Because it's about Trump being quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although that happens Actually, like every election. Actually, I think election. that's the opposite. Yeah. To be honest with you, I feel like People, what people said to me is this is like the first one where they're actually looking at the policies, not the leaders. The two front runners, they, they mean nothing to me. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. It's really about who do I think is going to do the best job for the economy, for the environment. And, you know, I, had, I heard a lot of people, obviously the economy is always the top for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but who has the best policies? Physicist Kenton White and accountant Aaron Kelly co-founded Advanced Symbolics, or ASI, in 2015. The market research company uses public data and AI to forecast consumer attitudes. You know, in the era of Cambridge Analytica and all that, people think it's just some sort of voodoo science, like we have a shame in making things happen. I want people to understand that nobody's, this is just math and it's science like anything else and it's, prob it's probabilistic. It's statistics just like it's always been, mm -hmm. yeah. except it's being done by poly instead of by phone operators. They can use a similar approach to predict political opinions. For 
be kind of hard to get information about millions and millions of people and apply statistical physics to it. But now I've got Facebook, now I've got Twitter. How do I use that? Though they don't work for either political parties or news outlets, Kelly and White saw the election prediction game as a way to promote their research method. Think about when we do traditional market research, how many times we interfere with the subject, with people, as we're studying them. We interfere by asking them to participate. We interfere in the result by asking a question and how we phrase that question. So our whole idea, we saw that with social media was, came a great opportunity to observe people in their natural environment. And aren't you going to get much better policy and a much more utopian society if you know exactly what the people in that society want. And I was inspired by science fiction growing up, uh, like Asimov's Foundation series, where you can use physics and statistical physics on people and populations and map out the whole course of the, the galaxy. Uh, I was quite disappointed when I learned that that's not really possible. The explosion of social media data offered White a potential treasure trove. He could apply statistical methods from physics to crunch what might seem to others like messy and unusable sources of data. It was the birth of the AI that ASI calls Polly. Polly, it was short for politics, so that's, we just happened to call her, we're gonna call her Polly. We didn't put any thought into it except politics. You know, Polly is made up of a number of different parts. Little programs that are crawling the web and collecting information. Those programs, called algorithms, are a set of instructions to perform a specific task. You've got an algorithm to say, when do you pick someone and when do you don't? Little algorithms that analyze that person and come up with, do I think the person's male or female or rich or poor, or young or old, or black or white. Algorithms that allow us to find people that are talking about uh, the topic we want to measure. If I showed you any one of these algorithms and how it worked, chances are you'd say, that's pretty simple. It's when you take dozens and dozens of put all these things together that uh, something more complex emerges. She's using more data than me or you or pretty much anyone here could uh, understand in a lifetime. But what is it that makes Polly intelligent? And notice I didn't say sentient, I said intelligent, right? So she is intelligent because she can grasp concepts mathematical concepts and see patterns in people that we can't see ourselves. But that description makes critics of AI uneasy. The AI's method comes across as a black box to outsiders, which leaves non-AI experts at a disadvantage to challenge the AI's inner workings or its conclusions. In the face of skeptics, ASI saw the Brexit referendum in June 2016 as a way to test their algorithm. Citizens of the United Kingdom were voting to remain in or leave the European Union. Traditional polls conducted almost daily revealed the country was split down the middle. As voting day approached, it became clear that undecided voters would likely determine the country's fate. Meanwhile, Polly was sifting through UK Twitter data to predict users' opinions without contacting them directly. Polly was seeing Remain right up until three days before the actual referendum. We had 52% voting for Remain, 48% voting for leave, just like everyone else in the world. And then there was the assassination of Joe Cox. Labour Party MP Joe Cox, who had been campaigning for Remain, was shot and killed by a far-right extremist on June 16th, 2016. Three days before the referendum, we wake up, we check in with Polly, and suddenly Britain is going to exit the EU. That had, was different from what she had been saying every other day of the week. 
and throughout this campaign. I was worried because an assassination is a black swan event. Black swan event is a rare event, one that my AI has never seen before. In none of the elections that I had trained her on had there been an assassination. Assassinations are rare. So we told her, ignore the assassination of Joe Cox. What is the result? Remain. So we tested again. Joe Cox is assassinated. Exit. So what had changed? What was she seeing that everyone else in the world was missing? The British pound plunged to a 30-year low, and world stock markets convulsed on the news that the majority of UK voters want out of the European Union, the second largest economy in the world. Polly observes things that we wouldn't even think to observe. We didn't ask her to observe these things. Well, we started going through, David Cameron had done a, many press conferences during that time, and there was one line, it's something he had said. Uh, it's right that we're suspending campaigning activity in this referendum, and everyone's thoughts will be with Joe's family and with her constituents at this terrible time. She noticed that throughout the, the year that she was observing people, if people came online and they said, I'm thinking of voting for an exit, if they had a network of people around them, friends and family, who calmly talked to them about why we shouldn't have a remain and what the consequences would be, over time that network was uh, effective in winning these people over to remain if they kept the dialogue going. But once people weren't talking anymore, a certain percentage of those undecided people would then go exit based on what she had noticed in the past. So she applied that algorithm, like she got it bang on. To better understand Polly's method, it's helpful to look at what she shares with traditional polling. One way of measuring public opinion is by interviews. Brief interviews are called polls. A few people are carefully selected as samples of the important groups of the general public. For decades, pollsters successfully reached people by landlines, direct mail, or knocking on doors. You'd get 80% response rates. Uh, all, all calls were to landlines. You didn't really have any cell phones. Uh, and people loved to participate in surveys. Uh, and, you know, getting it wrong, getting an election wrong, would be like you know, falling out of a boat and missing the water. That's the third knock, and the house looks dark. Yes, they're not home. But in the last 30 years, landline use and poll response rates have plummeted. You phone a, a landline in any house, you're much more likely to get an older woman than you're to get anybody else. Millennials, if you want to get millennials, you're probably not going to get them using landline. You're probably going to get them using cell phone, but as, as likely, you're, you're likely to get them online. Traditional pollsters needed to diversify their methods to reach different audiences. What you're trying to do is represent the political marketplace, the important political marketplace, the voting population, as accurately as you can. So what you need to have is good coverage of all of these different groups of the population, and then what you do is you try to look at them in aggregate. To cover the Canadian population in 2019, pollster Daryl Bricker combines landline pools with cell phone pools and online surveys. But Polly's AI takes a different tack. As our population gets more diverse, we actually need to have a bigger sample. <laughs> I mean, Canada is very different now than it was in 1970 or 1959 when we first started doing phone polling. But we haven't really evolved the science since the 1950s. So we're still getting the same sample sizes. We're still approaching the science in the same way, even though the population has changed a lot. Now with social media, finally, we have the opportunity to evolve this science for the first time in 50 years. Traditional polling has struck out on several recent election predictions. We're going to win the White House. We're going to take it back. And perhaps most famously, in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, pollsters overwhelmingly predicted Hillary Clinton to beat Donald Trump. If the lines are long tomorrow, please wait. Trump's win demonstrated that pollsters had missed the boat. They predicted the popular vote, but missed the tight local races in swing states, which delivered Trump an electoral college victory. Clearly their models were just completely off. The actual percentage of the vote 
predicted by the polls is actually what happened, but we weren't measuring the Electoral College. Obviously, you go through a, you know, a dark night of the soul whenever th these kinds of things happen. While it's too expensive and inefficient to pull each riding regularly by traditional methods, social media's huge scale makes that possible with AI. Talking about politics on social media or all your opinions on social media is now kind of the norm. Like that's become a, a normal way to communicate in the same way that people used to have, I think, long conversations on the phone frequently too. Now, of course, back in the day, you couldn't just tap people's phones. You had to call up and ask them about opinions, but, but now, the thing about social media that's interesting is when people are communicating their opinions on social media, uh, often they're doing it in a form that is public, uh, and that allows us to see what they're saying and to then uh, derive their, uh, their opinions from that. But not all social media platforms have data that are relevant to white. We use a sample uh, for data source depending on the problem that we want to look at. We have found that for elections, we get the strongest signal from Twitter. Many pollsters and social scientists question the value of Twitter data. Platforms like Twitter and Facebook is basically a group of self-selected people because not every Canadian are on social media. And even if they're on social media, not all of them use it to discuss politics. So get it, basically you're getting a slice of a smaller slice of the public. I think it's like 12 to 15% use Twitter for news, 20% use Twitter overall. In my own lay understanding of it, I tend to think of what's elite, journalist, and like high engaged super participants that are on Twitter. So not everyone is on Twitter. Let's take the low number, 17%. That is still a whole lot bigger than the current 9% or less that you get on dials. 17% of a country of 36 million is about 7 million people that we have access to. White thinks that an AI can sift through the large but typically young and urban user base of Twitter in Canada, and nonetheless, make forecasts that are representative of the entire population. Less than three weeks to go until election day, and I know at some point, your artificial intelligence polling system comes to a conclusion about what you think is going to happen on the 21st of October. Too early still, I presume. It's too early. Uh, what bodes well for Mr. Trudeau is that the Liberals have consistently, since the, the start of this campaign, been in first place. First place in the popular vote, or total vote, I guess, as we call no, it in Canada, or seat count? Seat count. So okay. that's the difference. Okay, good. We're doing each individual riding, so, and that's, as we saw in the Ontario election, it makes a big difference. Just because you're leading in the total vote count in the polls doesn't mean you're going to win. Exactly. Because vote efficiency yes. is what was where it's at in a first-past-the-post system. That's right. If you talk to most people that work with data from lots of people, they will say, I want to collect everything I can. Everything everyone is saying on Facebook and Twitter and Reddit and look at it all. Most critics assume ASI must draw on what is called the Twitter firehose. If so, White would need a way to filter the huge volume of real-time data and collect only the data useful to predict elections. Given the magnitude of the challenge, critics dispute White's optimistic claims. Now, if I, all I did was tap it in that fire hose, pull in that stream of data, you're gonna get a very skewed, distorted view. That's why we don't count tweets, we count people. Our big idea is what the pollsters have been doing works. That's the secret sauce. We make really, really good samples of people. In other words, rather than trying to clean up the Twitter fire hose, White claims that he has found a way to bypass it. Before Polly collects any actual data, Polly first builds a representative sample, just like pollsters. Those who say that you can look at social media and get a representation of what's happening at the riding level, uh, it's um, an interesting concept. We're certainly exploring it ourselves. Would I bet the farm tomorrow on being able to uh, uh, do an election in which I predict every single riding correctly based on social media? No. First of all, tracing people back to their ridings, difficult. 
It's difficult to figure out where's that account tweeting from. You know that old joke, the, uh, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Well, on Twitter, nobody knows whether you are in China, Russia, or right here in uh, Toronto. It's very difficult to say, yes, for sure, that account is coming from Canada. A representative sample of Canadians must consist of actual Canadians. White thinks he can confirm his Twitter users are legitimate. We use the information that people put on their account. So we see that they're in Canada. Great, they say, I'm in Canada. So we verify that. First test is, most of your friends also in Canada? Look at your history. Look at what you're talking about. If you're a Canadian, probably talking a little bit about maybe hockey or other Canadian things. Maybe you're talking about the cold weather. For pollsters, a sample is representative and random only when every member has an equal chance of appearing in the sample. Imagine that you had a whole uh, big bowl of jelly beans, and there was a red ones and blue ones and green ones and yellow ones. You don't need to count every single jelly bean to figure out that there's red ones, green ones, yellow ones, whatever the colors were I said. If, you, if all of them are, are, are equally distributed across the entire big bowl of jelly beans, if you stick in your hand and you pull it out and you put down uh, those jelly beans, you should have some representation of what's inside the jar. If you do it 10 times, you'll have a pretty good representation of what's in that jar. Not because the jar is getting smaller, but because the samples become consistent. So that's what sampling is really all about. Historically, pollsters sampled respondents by randomly selecting names from a phone book. In the digital world, random and representative sampling requires a different paradigm. There's a game called Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon that says, I'll pick a movie actor and try to link them back to Kevin Bacon in six hops. And you can play the same game on Facebook or Twitter. You can pick any person, any celebrity, and track, link yourself back to them in, on average, about between three and four connections to anyone in the world. Polly's algorithm uses a mathematical computation to guarantee an average minimum of hops between the Twitter users it collects. That's how it defines virtual distance and randomness between users. But critics argue that still doesn't address the lack of diversity among Twitter users. I can account for that bias in Twitter. I do it by saying, this is what the census is. This is how my distribution should be. And in the algorithm, you say, if it differs too much from what you expect, then you have to wait until it balances. So for example, when I see that my sample is starting to get a little bit lopsided on young urban males, you just stop collecting young urban males. You pause and you don't add any more of them to your sample until you start to get older rural female. So instead of looking like the majority of Twitter, Polly's sample is limited to a mix of users that match the actual demographics of each riding. White claims this addresses what critics see as a tragic flaw in Polly's main source of data. And that is the key algorithm behind Polly. If ever a bombshell hit a Canadian election campaign, it happened this week. Photos of Justin Trudeau in black and brown face swirled a very complicated brew of opinion in the country. Aaron Kelly, what is Polly telling you about the fallout from all of this? It was a big bombshell. Um, so Polly saw uh, Mr. Trudeau's numbers, the number of seats, the seat count fall by 25 seats yesterday. Now he is rebounding this morning. He's up five, so it's a net of 20 seat losses, but it knocked him from majority territory into minority territory. Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader, was the biggest winner yesterday. We saw his, his poll numbers go up, so he has really, uh, he really shone through this. So how does an algorithm go from tweets to projecting a drop in seats? What does a tweet actually mean? And what does it mean when we're tweeting? We know people are making jokes on the internet, and they're ironic. People are sharing more images, and that creates challenges. It's harder to interpret memes, which are these shorthand graphics. They're often pop culture references. And so I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. And then I'm like, well, if I don't understand this and my computational power is a you know, kind of a living, breathing human, what is this poor uh, computer you know, who's going to have to make sense of this? According to White, Polly is not trying to interpret the meaning of tweets at all. 
So my first few forays into election forecasting, uh, I ran the experiments. And consistently, what I found was just the plain old mentions outperformed the positive or negative sentiment every time. Polly tracks a percentage of users in the sample who mention each federal party. Then the AI compares those results to historical opinion patterns. The day after the blackface story broke, mentions of the Liberal Party spiked in relation to the others. Without understanding the meaning of these tweets, Polly interprets these changes in mentions as a drop in projected seats for the Liberals. So I think polls are interesting because they're a flashpoint in the past, right? They don't predict the future. They're a moment in time in which you're getting uh, a, a flavor of what the public is sort of thinking about. The AI collects data constantly. That makes it possible to identify patterns in user activity over time, compared to polls that are held less frequently. It's one of the biggest most difficult things in polling when you're doing these tracking polls is you see something happen for good or for bad, and you say, well, that's one piece of data. Is it gonna, you, then you have to wait another day. Is that real or was it just a blip? And you're always sort of in that, in that feeling of how many points makes a trend? Is it one? Probably not. Is it two? Maybe. Three? Yeah, four for sure. But you know, where is that point? In order to identify a trend, Polly uses public polls as a reference point. She analyzes patterns of user engagement, all the times her selected Twitter users mention political parties. Then she compares engagement with each party standing in the polls. Based on those relationships, Polly predicts if her data indicates a trend is stable or not. People sometimes, they'll be angry about something, about an issue, and they might be angry about it in a moment of time. But Polly is able, in a very unbiased way, to see through that anger and say, how long will it take the population to get over this anger and this hurt? And will it carry long enough to election day? Polly tracks Twitter engagement constantly. That continuous stream of activity is referred to as longitudinal data. By studying data in this way, Polly can identify patterns over time and then compare them to present activity. It also means Polly can look backwards in time at the data to re-examine unexplored trends. For the brownface, blackface scandal, um, I don't think there was a single pollster that asked a question of if you saw a party leader in a questionable costume in their 20s, would it change your opinion? I don't think anyone thought to ask that question. So the wonderful thing about Polly and the, the longitudinal studies is that I can go back and I can get an accurate measurement of exactly how you thought a week ago or a month ago. And that's something you can't do a week later or two weeks later by asking a question. I would suggest that perhaps uh, Canadians don't really care as, uh, about blackface as much as they perhaps profess to on social media. Um, there was a lot of outrage, and I would even call it performative outrage, on social media in particular, of being like, oh my God, I can't believe this. And it's like, really, you can't believe this? You can't believe that like, um, a, a, you know, a rich white guy from Quebec would have donned blackface at a ritzy private school that had a party-themed Arabian Nights. Like, I mean, the party in and of itself without the blackface was racist. <laughs> Given how massive that story was when it broke a week and a half ago, it has virtually, I don't want to say disappeared from the media, but you see so few references to it now. Is this story essentially over to the best that you can tell through your polling? Yeah, I think to keep bringing it up, for the other parties to keep bringing it up would be beating a dead horse at this point. I think he is recovering, and I think the slower recovery might be due to a you know, a mix of issues and not just blackface. Jugmeet Singh really impressed a lot of people with his initial statements after the blackface scandal broke. That goodwill is done now, so... Uh, done as in gone? Well, he's up two seats from before blackface, but that's down from having been up nine before. Huh. So it's starting to peter out. Well, phrases like artificial intelligence and machine learning are sometimes used in different ways to mean different sort of magical things about computers that think the way humans do. The modern meaning pretty much is just these uh, very sophisticated and very flexible algorithms 
which allow us to process very large amounts of data with, with uh, very complicated relationships between them and have uh, very flexible models which will allow the computer to sort of figure out uh, un unlikely relationships. Why is she AI? Why is she not just statistics or a collection of code? The difference is that she's able to do this mostly on her own. I don't have to go in and write a rule and say, now, Polly, when you see this, do this. Um, she's able to figure things out on her own. Polly's ability to learn is the basis for how she predicts future voting outcomes. The key to machine learning is a process known as training a statistical model. So when we talk about training a model, we mean we have some data where we already know the answer. So maybe it's how people voted in the last election, or maybe it's you know how many people did or didn't buy guns, but we already know the answer. And then we use that to draw inference and say, okay, it seems like men who live here are more likely to vote for that person, or men who subscribe to this magazine are more likely to buy a gun. And we learn those relationships and we say, let's see if we can use our model that was trained on the previous data to try to predict what's gonna happen next. Polly studies data from past elections, like 2015. She finds patterns between how people engaged on Twitter and how they actually voted in that election. The model expresses all those relationships as a mathematical probability. It then predicts how the voters in each riding in 2019 are most likely to behave. We start with, you know, uh, let's say I'm trying to explain, you know, how the liquid in this cup works, right? I start with a bunch of water molecules. You know, I have, I don't know, billions, trillions, gazillions, don't quote me on that. A lot of water molecules. And in physics, we know how they kind of work, the water molecules, they bounce off each other. But no one really cares in this water glass what all the molecules are doing, right? What's interesting is like, you know, what happens if I pour this water, what's the water gonna do? You know, if I shake my glass like this, how does the water move? And you're able to do figure out those things in physics because, you know, even though there's a gajillion water molecules. We have these theories that says when there's enough water molecules, we can up statistically figure out how they're gonna all move together to get kind of one description of how this big macroscopic system, you know, the water in this glass is actually working. And public opinion is basically the same thing, right? We have lots and lots of people. They each have their own opinions and actually predicting the opinion of any one person is pretty tricky, right? People are really chaotic. They change their opinion because of this and that. But if you get enough people together, you can statistically kind of model that population kind of as one thing and figure out, okay, even though, you know, Joe might change his opinion drastically tomorrow and uh, a Sarah really cares about this weird thing that's changing her opinion, I can actually statistically approximate overall, I can get a sense of where the aggregate opinion of this population is going. So in some ways, we're doing a very similar thing that you do in physics all the time, figuring out how all these atoms or molecules or whatever are working together, and we're just applying that now to humans instead. We like to think of ourselves all as unique desert flowers, and we really are. But the nice thing about statistics and math is when you get enough of us together, we can actually make some reasonable predictions on how, on average, how people's opinions are gonna form. No matter how sophisticated the model, the Achilles heel of election predictions is whether people will actually show up to the ballot box. The thing that terrifies me whenever I'm doing election polling, and I do get terrified because it's the reputation of the firm is on the, and your personal reputation is on the line, is what did I miss? What did I miss? What did I miss? How could I be wrong? How could I be wrong? A lot of times you get burned. There's uh, six or seven parties or whatever number you want to say uh, running in this election campaign in any riding, and then there's one party that's not on the ballot that's really important. It's called the apathy party. That's a problem for traditional pollsters because their predictions are based on past election voter turnout. Everybody goes, well, of course, of course I'm gonna vote. I mean, the number of people who say, well, I don't vote, I don't bother is, is, is tiny compared to the numbers who don't actually vote. That combined with the fact that people who are, aren't interested enough in politics to vote are extremely unlikely to either answer the door and have a long conversation with a canvasser or answer a polling phone call or to be putting their views on Twitter uh, about politics, right? So non-voters exclude themselves from the conversation in many ways, uh, which makes them harder to find and harder to understand and then harder to predict how many there'll be. In contrast, Polly's method is based on patterns of local riding support and is less vulnerable to the national voter turnout. 
philosophically, some critics still contend there's a problem. Polly predicts likely seed outcomes based on statistical correlation, but she does not explain why something happens. We're going to move on with the, uh, continue with the pipelines because there's been a lot of talk about this. Case in point, after the two French language debates in early October, Polly saw a bump in support for the Bloc Québécois, but not a cause. Mr. Trudeau, would you um, well, propose a pipeline or not? That's part of a process that requires that we have approval from communities, approval from Indigenous peoples. Will you tell Quebec, no, there will be no pipeline in Quebec? That is the reason for which I've put forward the idea of an energy corridor. Polly's handlers came up with the reason for the bump. In tweets from Quebec, they spotted a surge in the keyword pipeline. The people who are supporting the Bloc Québécois were saying they don't want a pipeline because they say Quebec has green energy, so why don't we take Quebec's green energy and sell it to Alberta rather than buy Alberta's dirty energy? Some pundits, like journalist Chantal Hébert, saw the debate differently. I would say that Shearer's performance, it was the worst performance of a contender for prime minister that I had seen in a French language debate in decades. So Shearer did lose the campaign in Quebec. He, he, it's not just that the Bloc won, it's also that he didn't make the right impression. While Hebert uses her experience to explain the change of support in Quebec, Kelly's explanation is also a human interpretation. Polly's data indicates only a correlation between block gains and the term pipeline, not a cause. So today is Friday, October 18th. It's three days before the election, so it's a Friday. The election's Monday. Going on air in half an hour, we ran the numbers again, because the last press release we sent out was yesterday. We said there was a, it's going to be a liberal minority government with a probability of 66%. And this morning, it's, Polly is saying it's a probability of 77%. Now, Polly gets more confident every day as people come closer to making a final decision. I worry every time when I go on the air that when I say this is what Polly is seeing, that I will affect the outcome, that people will change their votes based on the latest information. Um, we, I think we do see evidence of that. Even before Polly came along, social scientists were posing the question, does publishing poll results during a campaign reflect opinion or actually shape it? Some say the greater scale of AI makes this question even more pressing. I think AI tests the myths of neutrality when it comes to the political process, both the neutrality of journalists, but also the neutrality of pollsters. On the one hand, parties use polls and use technology to try to decide what they're going to do, but the media uses polls and predictions to try to get a sense of what's happening. And it's a feedback loop. Right? It doesn't matter whether you're inside the process or outside the process. The perception of the future determines the future. So if the media starts saying that the NDP doesn't have a chance, the NDP will start thinking it doesn't have a chance. So it really gets into the influence that predictions have on how we treat the future. And I think in that regard, it doesn't matter whether it's the party, whether it's the media, whether it's an individual polling firm, putting these predictions out into the public influences the public and therefore influences the outcome. Decision day is Monday. Most polls show a virtual tie between the Liberals and the Conservatives. Does Pauly, the artificial intelligence algorithm, have a more definitive view of what's to come? You have no idea how many people this week have come up to me and said, what's Pauly saying? What's Pauly saying? You're wearing red for a reason. <laughs> yes. You're wearing red yes, for a reason. Yes, I chose these colors on purpose because what Pauly is telling us is that it's going to be a Liberal government. A liberal minority government? A liberal minority government. Does that mean you are ready to conclusively call this election? Well, it's interesting, right? 77%, it's strong. It's not as strong as we'd like to see it. It's not as strong as it was at this point in 2015, where we were able to call the election a month ahead of time. The electorate is much less decided this time around. There at the bottom of the graph, a considerable number of ridings that are still yeah, more than in 20. contention. Yeah. More than 20 ridings still undecided in the province. I do feel obliged to point this out that in the last national election in the United States, you know, all those trackers were saying that Hillary Clinton had an 80% chance of winning the election, and she did not at 80. Mm -hmm. You've got the Liberals at 77. Right. 
This ain't over, I presume. No, it's not. The difference between sort of the Hillary and this was that we're counting each individual seat. So we're seeing at the popular vote level, the Liberals and the Conservatives are actually tied nationally. But it, it's when you get down to the seats that it starts to get interesting, that you see the divide here yeah, because how, of our system. How that popular vote translates into seat by seat by seat by seat, obviously that's what matters here. It's election night 2019. Almost 18 million Canadians have cast their ballots, including the advanced polls. That represents a turnout of 66%, several percent higher than expected. The Liberals form the government, but the Conservatives win the popular vote. Days later, it's time to compare the actual results with the seat predictions. Federal election 2019 wrapped up, of course, this week with a Liberal minority government. This is the national seat projection that you gave us, which showed the Liberals in a range between 116 and 173, but essentially at 145. The Tories at 123, the NDP at 48, the Bloc at 46, and the Greens somewhere between one and five, and you have the possibility there of a couple of independents and a People's Party. Now let's flip that over, and this is what the national seat projection was on Sunday. So the last one was Saturday. This one is Sunday, the day before the election. And you could see that things have changed. You've got the Liberals now at 155, Tories at 118. And then let's roll to Monday. And this is what the actual election results were. 157 Liberal seats, 121 Conservatives, 32 Bloc, 24 New Democrats, three Greens, one Jody Wilson-Raybould, and nothing for the People's Party. So let's start with this. How would you characterize the accuracy with which Polly did her job? If you ever want to evaluate how well someone did predicting an election, I think the fairest thing to do is to compare them to other people who tried to predict the election. If one company did better than all the other companies, then that's probably a pretty good result. The day before the election, some traditional pollsters were only predicting the popular vote. Others were also willing to predict a liberal minority but few publicly predicted a narrow range of seats. According to pollster 338 Canada, they correctly predicted the outcome of 299 of the 338 ridings. According to Advanced Symbolics, Polly correctly predicted 308. Was this, um, quote unquote, an easy election to predict? It wasn't an easy election to predict, but it was predictable, right? And, and I find it, you know, it's interesting because everybody was saying it was so close. That's the, that's why being able to look at the seat count and do the ridings is, it's becoming almost a necessity if you want to do polling. We saw it at first with the Trump election in the states, and that's been consistent. It seems that elections are getting closer and closer, and so obviously when it's a minority government, it's a little bit harder to call. But this was consistent for Polly that she always saw it as a liberal win. Uh, if you look at our election results, we did really well in the 2019 election. But there were some writings we got off. Um, it comes down to we are making assumptions that all parties are campaigning equally on the last weekend uh, before the election in all writings where they might have a chance. All the political scientists out there are probably laughing at me right now. It turns out that's not true. <laughs> it turns out political parties pick writings that strategically they want to win. And we haven't taken any of that into account. Uh, it's why I would love to have a, a really open dialogue with the people that know the political science. Both White and Kelly proudly claim that Polly's final seat prediction was more accurate than most established pollsters, though White does admit ASI's lack of expertise in how campaigns work. To critics of an AI method, this admission reveals some naive and damaging political assumptions. But to supporters, Polly's relative accuracy in projecting seats shows great promise for AI. Whenever I, I hear people say, I've got the thing, I sit back and say, okay, you've got the thing. Well, you know, the big publicly traded research corporations that have more money to do this kind of stuff than anybody else has to do it, not to mention the Googles, 
and the, uh, and the Facebooks and the Twitters and all these other people who have all of this money and all the best data scientists all working on this kind of thing. They don't, they can't predict it based on their platform. Veteran pollsters and statisticians still demand more proof. They continue to doubt the value of Twitter as a primary data source. And they insist that Polly establish a much longer track record of predicting elections before they'll concede this method is reputable and accurate. There's a common saying that's used as a disclaimer when people buy products and so on that says uh, past performance is not an indicator of future performance. And I think that applies to predictive algorithms as well. If they've done well in, say, the last couple elections, I think that works in their favor, but still not a guarantee. And as they do better and better in more and more elections, I think you can start to trust them more and more. According to ASI, Polly's prediction model will only get better with more election data and with input from social scientists to refine their algorithms. We've come a long way to get to where AI is at today. And a lot of what has helped AI get to where it is at today is, um, well, with the internet, uh, an explosion of data. But the explosion of public data comes with risks. Social media is free in exchange for a user's privacy. Personal data is then available for marketing. Critics also warn that platforms are using the data against their own users by making the platforms more addictive. When the car came out, there was no seatbelt. There was no um, airbags. But when we discovered that, oh my gosh, these cars can get into an accident, they can run people over, we started demanding better brakes. We started demanding airbags. We started demanding seatbelts. The first 10, 15 years of social media, the argument was, let's not put handcuffs on these companies because we want to see where and what they can do and how they can help society. But we're now discovering all the car accidents. We're discovering all the harms that they can do. So for me, the, I think the next few years is going to be debating what does regulation of social media look like. I think the big problem is we're thinking of campaigning in an analog world when in fact it's all automated and digital and neither our language nor our laws really anticipate the power that Facebook has and the way in which individuals or political parties or foreign governments can use that power to tip the scales of the election, if not just muddy people's perception of the election. Because the whole point we have an election is to legitimize the outcome. If people believe, rightly or wrongly, that algorithms have taken over the election, well, then they're not going to see the results as legitimate. They're not going to see the government as legitimate. And therefore, it's going to make government's ability to actually govern that much more difficult. In many ways, using data to get people to vote and pulling people to participate in politics is fairly beneficial. In fact, if you were to ask me what could data be good for, it's like getting more engagement in politics. And so I don't think that by definition, political advertising is a problem. What I think is that the way that online advertising works and the fact that it requires so much surveillance to develop ad profiles and that the way you're doing targeting is so much ad fraud, those are the kind of real issues. I think Canadians are feeling creeped out about the way in which technology and surveillance is playing a growing role in their society but I think they feel powerless. So we've had this notion of, if you want privacy, stay at home. If you want privacy, only tell. But if you decide to participate in the public square, if you put information out there, you will be held to have said, it's okay for anybody to do anything with that information. And that is what just does not work in the modern world. I think it's really quite pernicious to think that, well, we'll solve this with consent, and we're just going to change, do you consent in or consent out? The flaw in that is that still the individual against this massive organization, and the great divide is they know a lot about you, you don't know a lot about them. We, we invented all of these structures, and we can invent something else. Polly's election predictions depend on the ongoing popularity of Twitter and easy access to its data. But if new regulations to protect user privacy or restrict the social media business model came into force, they could profoundly change the way people use social media. I don't believe social media is going to become more private. There will be a need for public networks where people can go to create content that anyone can view and anyone can engage with. Um, 
kind of making a big bet on that too. I don't know. I think maybe the traditional pollsters are afraid of this because it's the future. There was a famous Twitter chatbot that Microsoft put out. I don't, I forget the name of the chatbot, but it was a demonstration of natural language AI. And it was a really, really sophisticated AI, just wonderful. And a lot of people got wind of this little chatbot Twitter account, and they started saying, what could we do to teach this AI to be the most offensive, repugnant Twitter account on the planet? And they succeeded. This little AI became a horribly racist, xenophobic, and so Microsoft had to shut it down. Is that the AI's fault? Why do we as people feel the need to be that miserable and that mean and that bad to, you know, our, to us and show that example to the machines? When you see bad children, it's usually bad parents. So when it comes to AI, when it comes to all of this, I, that to me is my North Star. I have to be a good parent. I have to be the best parent for Polly. 